Rather than jumping straight into coding, I'm gonna, I can't resist the urge to give a little bit of backstory, not just about what HTML and CSS are and how they work, but a little bit about why they're actually needed. So this story, this video is sort of the backstory of why HTML, why CSS, which is the story of plain text. So first, what is plain text? What is the plain text format? Well, to explain that, we need to take an even further step back into the idea about binary code. So as we all probably know on some level, computers uh, can do incredible things, but also computers are essentially kind of stupid in that everything that a computer does needs to be something you can express in terms of one of two states, on or off. All a computer can really compute is something that is either on or off. And if you think about, you know, computers are electrical machines, uh, electricity is something that's either on or off. So it sort of makes sense that deep down inside your computer is just a thing that knows two states, on and off. And that's what binary code is. Binary is like sequences of ons and offs. Often you will see this described as like zeros and ones, but that's just a shorthand. What it really means is on, off, or like different voltages. It's all got to be expressed in terms of electricity. With any kind of storage format on a computer, if you get right down and look at it, it's going to be ones and zeros, ons and offs, binaries, either ors. So this is like a microscopic view of the surface of a compact disk, which is sadly pretty much an obsolete medium now, but you can see that the way that compact disks work is they have either reflective surfaces, which mean uh, off, uh, I mean on, or non-reflective, which means off. So it's it's all been turned into sequences of ons and offs by means of reflectiveness. So computers can only compute, can only understand things that can be expressed in terms of on and off, zero and one. But even though that seems like a real restriction, like, oh, can we actually express everything there is to express about human culture and nature in terms of zeros and ones? Well, thankfully humans are pretty ingenious, so we come up ways of representing all kinds of things in terms of on and off. Now, computers are pretty much invented by scientists and mathematicians and engineers and people who really care about math. So they very quickly came up with ways of representing numbers and performing mathematical operations on zeros and ones. Um, so they took care of that pretty quickly. Um, but strangely enough, it took them a lot longer to come up with agreed upon ways of representing letters and non-numerical characters, which, and I speak as a professor of English literature, is the kind of stuff that I care about a lot more. There was a tradition for representing characters in terms of on or off um, that dated all the way back to the 19th century, and that was Morse code. So um, Morse code, in fact, directly informed the first standard that was used for computers. So this is just a look like if you think, can you take a letter and just express it in terms of ons and offs? Well, they don't have on and off, but short and long. So it's like a binary system, and A would be D. My name would be spelled <laughs> So sorry to put that in a video, but just to say that it's a way of you turn letters into shorts and longs. And so this old system of Morse code was used um, to make the first standard for representing characters on computers, which was called ASCII. Uh, I love the word ASCII. I just like saying it. It stands for American Standard Code for Information Interchange, and it was first published in 1963, which might seem like a long time ago, but when you think about how long digital or binary-based computers had been along, it's actually kind of amazing how long it took them to come up with it. So the first ASCII standard, um, which is the first standard of plain text, the subject of this video, used seven bits, that means seven ones or zeros, um, to represent each character in the alphabet. For instance, this sequence of ones and zeros, which is very hard for a human being to read, a computer would easily, using the ASCII code, be able to turn that into a phrase. So that's 49 bits, 49 ones or zeros, and since uh, we're working on a seven-bit system, each sequence of seven represents one character, so 
47, 49 divided by 7, 7 characters here. This, as it happens, is the way of ASCII encoding the word keyword, and I put this in not only because I wrote a book called Modernism Keywords, but also because one of the real advantages of taking text and turning it into binary code is that you can now search for keywords without the ability to turn letters into ones and zeros that computers could understand we wouldn't have stuff like Google. Computers, you know, they'll do incredible things for you, but you need to be able to speak their language. You need to be able to turn things into ones and zeros. So looking at this in a slightly more sensible way, here are all seven characters turned into ones and zeros. Um, I mean, it's still confusing, but you can start to do kind of fun things here. Like you can be like, um, how do I, which bit of these seven bits controls whether a, a letter is capitalized or not? Well, it can't be that one because those are all one. No distinctions are being made there. But in the second row here, you can see that zero seems to correspond to capitalization, whereas uh, the one in the second position there corresponds to lowercaseness. This beautiful, beautiful thing is the original 1963 ASCII chart in seven bits. And this, you could take uh, any of these letters or characters or symbols and map them into uh, ones and zeros. So for instance, that letter K that we were talking about a second ago, uh, uppercase K, would be read like this, one, zero, zero, and then one zero one one. This is so. This is all just conventional, right? Like, there's no necessary, obvious, essential connection between K and the sequence one zero zero one zero one one. It's just that a bunch of people got together and were like, okay, let's find a way to represent all of these characters in terms of uh, binary. Now, if you look at this chart, you can kind of see that even though we're talking about letters here, the presence of mathematicians is still pretty obvious. Like, you notice that um, all of the symbols seem to be mathematical symbols. Like, you know, I think of this as a pointy bracket because I'm not a mathematician, but they probably would think of these as lesser than or greater than signs equals uh, most of the signs are related to math and you'll notice that tons of stuff is missing from this. For instance, accented characters. You can't write French or German uh, in in the first version of ASCII and you know non-Western characters, Cyrillics, um, any kind of uh, Asian characters not possible in this setup. So the good news is that eventually they revised these standards and today we have much better plain text formats. So plain text, that's what plain text is, okay? Plain text is the most basic way of representing letters on a computer. Um, now it's 8-bit that we usually use, not 7-bit, but it's basically the same thing, okay? It's the simplest way of representing characters. And I use plain text all the time. I make all of my notes and outlines for my work in a plain text editor called Text Wrangler that you will see in a second. Um, and plain text is also used in a million different ways. Um, for instance, it's the language that all programming and coding is done in, and we're going to use it for that purpose. But plain text also has some pretty serious limitations, most notably tons of stuff that you know writers and designers care about, like fonts, italics, colors, images, links. None of the like rich text stuff that make reading and writing on the web nice are possible in plain text. So let me finally leave my PowerPoint slides and show you some stuff. So this is a text editor program called Text Wrangler. Um, those of you using PCs might want to use something called Sublime Text instead, or there's a million really good text editors. I'm a Mac user and I happen to really like using Text Wrangler. So you can see that I've made a file here called helloworld.txt. And all that I've written in it is the phrase hello world. But there's like if I wanted to make that bold in plain text, I can't. There's no way of doing it. There's no like menu I can click on. There's no option. There's no right clicking I can do. Plain text, there's no bold. It's just characters. I could do something like that to make like, oh, now it's bold, but my there's no way of actually changing the appearance of the letters. It's just characters. I can do like this kind of stuff, but um, no changing of the appearance. Um, you can actually load up plain text files in web browser. So I'm going to go into Chrome and I'm going to open up a file 
I already pointed to the right folder. I'm going to open up that hello world text file that I made in Texture Wrangler. And you can see it can read it, but there's no color information. There's no like links or anything. If I go back to the Text Wrangler and edit hello world.txt and then reload it in Chrome, sure, it'll update it, but I'm not going to get any color. There's just no way out of it. It's just plain text. This can actually be kind of freeing if you're making notes and stuff and you can use you know like capital letters if you want and you can use like dashes to make lists um, it's kind of stylish for some reason you can have like beautiful files in plain text but um, anyway if you want to actually do like links images fonts you're stuck plain text just plain cannot do it no pun intended so the question, I taught a class um, in which I was sort of talking about this issue and I issued a challenge to my students, which is, okay, say all you have is ASCII, because if, if essentially that is all that you have on a computer. You, can, you have numbers and characters and you have to do everything you need to do with those tools if you want to make a system for representing bold or showing fonts. You need to be able to do it in plain text. Um, that's the only way a computer is going to understand it. So I had this challenge where I was saying, using just those plain text ASCII characters, come up with a scheme um, that will allow you to identify italics, bold, colors, and font sizes. You need to create some kind of code using just ASCII to identify each of these things so that this code can then be decoded, say, by a hypothetical web browser that can then interpret a code and turn it into bolds. I gave my students this challenge, take um, William Carlos Williams' famous opening line so much depends upon a red wheelbarrow but uh, you know take these characters and bold them make a pawn big make red appear in the color red and make wheelbarrow italics um, and I said okay you you're, this is your toolkit right you can only use these things in order to come up with your encoding language and this is the kind of stuff that the students came up with um, so, you know, like this group here, so much has to be in bold. They decided that the sequence plus colon uh, is going to indicate start of a passage of bold and plus colon is going to then also indicate the end of the bolded passage. Uh, and apparently this like up arrow plus colon means uh, bigger font size and asterisk R means red and two forward slashes means italic. So this is a totally fine markup language like as long as we all agree that um, that that's what that means that plus colon means um, bold then this will totally work so what they've done is this is a markup language they're using plain text just those ASCII characters um, and then creating a convention where I, we're all gonna agree that plus colon means um, bold and then uh, we're good we will be able to do incredible new things uh, that are beyond the capabilities of just plain text. So any format that you use that allows you to do things like fonts and large different font sizes, different like indentations and stuff, they're all going to come up with their own markup language, so somewhat like these. Now proprietary markup formats like the ones used in a Microsoft Word doc format Yes, they can overcome the limitations of plain texts, but they're specifically designed to be hard to decode. Like when you open them up in a plain text editor, you're, you're not supposed to be able to see what's going on. Their whole business depends on like only a Microsoft um, browser can actually read what's going on. So let me just give you a look at that. So for instance, here is um, a conference paper that I once gave, um, looking at it just as a Word file. Uh, under the hood, you can see that it's a whole bunch of just complete nonsense that a human is not supposed to be able to read somewhere. Like, I mean, you can see some of the text there. That's, those are the words that I wrote. But so much of this file, like at least 80% like of it, is made up of characters that I don't understand and somewhere in those characters is things like which font size and where I wanted things to be indented. Um, but it's not, it's not at all obvious to a human just looking at that format. So that's a proprietary format. Um, yes, all that encoding is being done in the background, but there's no way that a human being can look at it and understand it. 
Now, open formats like HTML and CSS, they do the same thing. They overcome the limitations of plain text. They allow you to do font sizes, bold, italics, all that stuff. But they're specifically intended, not indented as I have written there, intended to be as easy as possible to decode for a human. Um, so just to give you a little preview of the next videos, like for instance, um, this is the minimum web page and um, this would be a paragraph and it's like very friendly to look at. Like once you get it, you're like, okay, P means paragraph. It's not just a sequence of unreadable nonsense like in a word file. Okay, I won't give you too much more info about HTML because that is for the next video. But in summary, here's what HTML and CSS are doing or what they're for. They're standardized, agreed upon, open languages, not proprietary, not secret to make money, but open so everyone can use them. They're languages that use plain text to overcome the shortcomings of plain text. Okay, so that's what plain text is. That's why that's the shortcomings it has, and that's why HTML and CSS needed to be invented. So now that you know that, you can move on to the next video where I'll explain what HTML is all about.